Good morning. Welcome to another summer service at the Universalist Unitarian Church. My name is Jill Thomas, and I'm chair of the worship committee. That's why you get me. Uh, Reverend Jennifer is back in town soon, and she will return to the pulpit next week with our fa my favorite service, the blessing of the animals. I have a little chihuahua you will all meet. Uh, pets are supposed to be on a leash or in a kennel or a carrier. Bring your well-behaved pets. Leave the not-so-well-behaved pets at home. Those pets can be blessed by Zoom or by photo. See Reverend Jennifer if you have any questions or concerns. Uh, the service following the animal blessing is the annual question and, and it, question and answer service. Reverend Jennifer holds this service every year. It's an opportunity for the congregation to create the Sunday message. Uh, send her your questions ahead of time or in person during the service. She'll respond to as many as she can during the sermon, and that will serve as input uh, to the rest of the year. Uh, on Labor Day Sunday, Reverend Jennifer returns to her series on democracy, and given the ever-shifting dynamics of our politics, it's a time to speak to dignity and community. It's a very timely topic, topic for uh, our approaching election season. Then on September 8th will be our traditional in-gathering service. This is often considered the formal beginning of the church year. It will be our annual water service. You're invited to bring a small sampling of water gathered from someplace sacred to you. Or if you haven't collected any water anywhere, you can bring some symbolic water, otherwise known as tap water. Everyone is welcome here, regardless of your race, ethnic background, your gender, your socioeconomic status, your abilities, or your politics. Like all UU churches, we are a creedless church. That is, we have no defined set of beliefs that members must accept. We value religious freedom. We believe that everyone must ultimately make up his or her own mind about questions of spirituality and religion. The purpose of the church isn't to provide answers, but to assist and encourage each of us in the search for our own truth. Now, just as we cherish our pets, we cherish nature. And the land our church occupies, it is the home to an ecosystem of insects, birds, reptiles, and mammals. Last week, I said if you were lucky, you might be able to see a deer. And at coffee hour, I had somebody come up to me and show me a picture of a deer they took as they were entering the building. I thought that was pretty neat. Uh, we recognize that this is the ancestral land of the Peoria people. They were here long before the first Europeans came down the river. We celebrate them for who they were and for who they are today. Now would be a good time to turn your devices to worship mode, otherwise known as silent. And here's a slide to help. And I just want to add a caveat that some of us use our phones as a medical device and are not able to turn our phones off. So if you hear somebody beeping, give them a little grace. It's always nice to have folks in the sanctuary for our service, but sometimes it's just not possible. At those times, you can live stream the service via Facebook. If that Sunday time doesn't work for you, you can find videos of past services on YouTube and audio of the sermons uh, from our church website. We have a number of things to help make your worship more comfortable. There are hearing assist devices, a child safe area where kids can play quietly. There are fidgets in the back if you'd like to borrow one. If there is anything you need, <clears throat> our ushers and our greeters are here to help. Please wear a name tag so we can all get to know each other. Again, I'll remind you my name's Jill Thomas because my name tag is right on the table by the door, so I would pick it up when I came to church this morning, and that's where it's still. <laughs> um, we have service, or we have, uh, after the service, we have coffee and refreshments and fellowship hall, and it can sometimes be a little intimidating to go to fellowship hall the first couple.
couple times, but to make it easier, we have a newcomers table. And some of our members will be sitting there to give you a warm welcome and to answer any questions you have. This is a very active church. There are services, classes, activities, and gatherings. To stay in the know of what's going on, we have a monthly newsletter called The Builder, a Friday flock note sent to your email address, and notices on most of the social media sites. Please see the greeters to get uh, hooked up with one of those distribution lists so you can follow what's going on. Now let us begin our worship service by singing together our opening hymn. Number 163, For the Earth Forever Turning. I would like to ask Michaela Thomas to come give us opening words. Good morning. We gather here to worship, to seek the truth, to grow in love, to join us in service, to celebrate life's beauty, to find healing for its pain, to honor our kindship with each other and with the earth, to create more compassionate worlds beginning with ourselves, to wonder at the mystery that gives us birth, to find courage in the journey's end, and listen for the wisdom that guides us in the quietness of this moment. Now I'd like to invite Kathy McNeil to do our chalice lighting. We hold that moment in our spirit by Adam Slate. When the great mosaic of humanity is treated with respect and dignity, when no person is threatened by hunger or war, when we have extended hospitality to the stranger and tended to the sick, when equity and justice reign everywhere, then we shall all be free. We like this flame to hold that moment in our spirit and in our minds until we can make it real. Lighting candles during our UU service takes on many meetings, and just like the UUs that light them, each meaning is unique. 
Some are for joy, gratitude. Some are for a wish, a hope. Some are for a mourning or a remembrance or a fear. No matter the reason, you are all welcome to light a candle this morning. I will light the first one. While Kathy plays music, you are welcome to come forward and light a candle of your own. Many of you uh, received an email this week that said it was from Reverend Jennifer, and it was asking for Amazon gift cards. Please ignore these requests. They are from a hacker. Uh, they seem to be from area codes 516 or 309. Uh, so please block those numbers. And if you did give gift cards, please let the office know. Uh, she would never ask you to send her gift cards via a text. Uh, I have blocked the number on my phone and have reported it as a hacker, and we all need to do the same. If you need help, I'm sure someone can help you at Coffee Hour. Uh, neither the COVID websites, none of them are actually reporting statistics at the moment, but even my own doctor's office told me it's on the rise. So. We ask that everyone be careful if you're uh, feeling puny, as my mom would call it. Make sure you test and wear a mask and make sure you don't try not to spread it. Uh, because the Supreme Court basically told cities it's okay to criminal criminalize being homeless, our city council is considering an ordinance which will criminalize unhoused human beings who are caught sleeping on public property. This could mean sending those who are already oppressed and suffering into being warehoused and jailed. If you see this as a wrong solution, 
a poor housing and inadequate medical, medical, mental health care, you can contact your city council official or speak up at the next meeting on Tuesday, August 13th. Meetings begin at 6 p.m. There's a group of citizens planning to defend the human beings who are homeless by speaking at the meeting and holding signs like plan, not a ban, or keys, not fees. Now let us take a moment of silence for all the joys and concerns that reside in our hearts but remain unspoken. Now is the time our younger members will go to the opposite wing for religious education. Summer sessions are held one room schoolhouse style and the theme for today is stories. Now let's sing the children and their helpers from the sanctuary. The generous financial contributions from those in the past have allowed us to be the liberal religious voice in Peoria that we are today. A financial contribution today helps to keep our current bills paid and helps fund us for the future. A gift today not only helps our church, it also helps our community through a custom called Share the Plate. Our Share the plate program allows for one half of the cash offering from our Sunday collection plate to be donated each month to a local charity. These charities are selected because they share in our UU values. This month, our Share the Plate recipient is Hope Renewed Youth Conference. This organization provides scholarships to deserving candidates in the profession of teaching and law enforcement. The recipients commit to working in the community after they complete college. Ideally, this will help change the culture of both professions, allowing for more people of color, and by developing an investment in the community from both working and living in it. The organization is a charity that relies solely on fundraising and donation. You may put your cash or check in the offertory plate, put your donation in an envelope, and Indicate if it's for the pledge, a pledge or split with the charity, or if you'd like it all to go to the charity. There's also a QR code on the back of the order of service to make a contribution. Thank you for your time, your generosity, your gift of energy and finances to support our liberal tradition. Will the ushers please come forward and collect the offertory?
Sarah Allen is our speaker this morning, and she's been a UU for 15 years. She has presented topics for the OLLI program at Bradley, including women in early aviation. She has a pilot's license. And she's co-facilitated this summer Presidential Mothers and a short novel, The Samurai's Garden. She's been chair of the welcoming committee for many, many, many years. Uh, what she enjoys most about being at the UU Church is it's a place to question and deepen her spiritual values. And she cherishes the many friendships that she has formed. Please welcome Sarah Allen. Good morning. Um, what I would like to do first is for everyone to give a big round of applause for Jill Thomas, who has facilitated all of the summer services. She has brought all the wonderful speakers here, uh, and obviously she does a lot with each service, and she did to herself. So for all the summer services that we've all enjoyed, let's give Jill a round of applause. So, why did I choose this topic of regenerative agriculture? There we go. And the reason I did was I um, gave a study group, I gave one session of a study group this uh, spring on regenerative agriculture at OLLI. I volunteered to find a documentary and then facilitate this discussion. So I looked through all kinds of documentaries. I had a really good time looking at all of them, but this is the one that touched my heart, was one called, Colm told me just to not hit this thing too often, but to wait. There we go. It's Kiss the Ground, and it is a documentary. It's in your order of service. It's really slickly produced. It was done with a lot of people in Hollywood. It's really interesting. It's about an hour and 15 minutes long. So if you get interested in the topic, that's something you might want to watch. I did not do my homework for this talk. I didn't come in and talk to Colm and Anthony a couple of weeks ago and ask if I could present my videos. And I just learned this morning that there's no technical way to do that here. So what I intended to do was show you the trailer from this um, documentary that I saw, which um, you can see on the internet. It's, uh, the documentary itself is available on Netflix and Amazon Prime. So I wanna talk just for a minute about what conventional farming looks like around us and in the, um, all over the world where we're using machinery. Farmers put fertilizer, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides on the land every year. And the land looks like this. It's just dirt. There's nothing growing on it for about eight months of the year, which leads to CO2 being released, carbon dioxide, which, as you know, forms um, greenhouse gases. So they plow or till the dirt every year, usually a couple of times. Um, the cost of the chemicals and fuel have risen much higher than inflation has over the last several years. And the farmers are having a heck of a time trying to figure out how to pay their bills because the price that they're getting for their crops has not risen. So farmers are actually going broke. Um, the guy that does Dave's and my taxes, my husband Dave Jackson is here and he has a small family farm, uh, is from Toulon, Illinois, and he does a lot of farmer taxes. And he told me that um, farmers are having a really, really hard time. So, of course, farmers are also being hurt by all the chemicals. Their health is being hurt, whether they are in the field picking strawberries or asparagus for us, or whether they are conventional farmers just applying all this chemicals to the land. So the health of the land, we've lost the microbiome in soils, which are healthy and produce healthy plants. We omit, we emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere when we till. 
Chemicals and fertilizers pollute our water. We've lost a third of our topsoil in the last 40 years. And the United Nations forecasts that we only have 60 harvests left, that our topsoil will be completely gone in 60 years, which is terrifying. So we use the words dirt and soil. Dirt is just sand, silt, clay, and pebbles, and a couple other minerals in there. Soil is dirt with a healthy microbiome made up of worms and fungi and bacteria and insects and microbes. All kinds of things live in healthy soil. Of course, coming out of this dirt, the plants that come out of it that we eat and the ones that feed our animals have been greatly depleted of vitamins and minerals. I've seen estimates of up to 45% of the nutritive value in food is gone uh, after this time. And of course, animals are held in feedlots, whoops, and where they're diseased and they're fed corn that they can't digest, and so they emit methane, which we all uh, talk about. Of course, People were suffering from poor nutrition, chemical pollution of our food, too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, water filled with cancer-causing nitrates, diseases caused by our food, our water, and our atmosphere. So we can't continue this form of agriculture that we have been doing for the past number of years. So I want to talk about regenerative agriculture, which is uh, a form of agriculture that's been practiced for maybe the past 20 years and is growing. Um, as you see, I was going to show you a video. Gabe Brown is one of the pioneers of the regenerative movement. He has a ranch in North Dakota um, where he has all different kinds of crops and all different kinds of animals. And he talks very convincingly about the um, benefit to the earth of regenerative farming. So I'm sorry I don't get that to show you that. Oop. So in regenerative farming, one of the principles is that we never plow or till the ground. We never have bare ground. Bare ground, as I said, emits carbon dioxide and water. So it um, also um, causes drought where if we have plants on the ground all the time called cover crops, they take carbon dioxide out of the air and put it into the soil through the plants, and also they hold water into the soil. So uh, regenerative farming doesn't use chemicals and doesn't use fertilizer. Um, many, many crops are farmed and rotated unlike my PowerPoint, which doesn't want to. Um, on the left, you see a field in conventional agriculture, which once the, the cash crop has been taken off, you just have bare dirt, which does nothing for anybody. On the right, you have what a field looks like after the cash crop has been harvested, and you have green. And all that greenery uh, helps keep our earth cooler and puts nutrition into the soil. So this is just one farmer, and I don't know where this farmer is. One farmer says the cash crops include wheat, winter triticale, oats, corn, sunflowers, peas, hairy vetch, and alfalfa. That's opposed to what you see around here, which is corn one year and beans the next year, and corn's the third year and beans the fourth year, uh, which depletes the soil. And for cover crops, they put in millet, sorghum, uh, proso millet, buckwheat, sun hemp, radishes, turnips, ryegrass, canola, phacelia, cowpeas, soybeans, sugar beets, red clover, sweet clover, kale, rape, lentils, mung beans, and sub clover. So all of those um, cover crops are seeded together. Instead of one cover crop one year and one the next, they put up to 30 different kinds of uh, seeds into the planter and plant them all together because each different, uh, each different plant has things to add to the nutrition in the soil, and each one harvests carbon a little bit differently.
So livestock are raised their whole lives uh, in open pastures. Um, there is quite a bit of science to how they do this and how they move the livestock around in order to keep the grasses and the, uh, all the plants healthy rather than letting the animals eat them down to the ground. But these are cows out in a pasture and these are chickens and they're never put in a feedlot or in a place where they're just all crammed together and uh, sick. So regenerative agriculture builds soil organic matter and biodiversity um, through never tilling the soil, using cover crops, rotating cash crops, using no chemicals, and integrating animals into the farming process. It is said that a single tablespoon of healthy soil contains more life than there are humans on Earth. And of course, dirt contains nothing. So healthy soil allows plants to grow to their productivity without disease or pests and doesn't need any chemicals or fertilizer. Uh, it's teeming with earthworms, insects, bacteria, fungi, algae, protozoa, nematodes, and other tiny creatures. And the bacteria produce natural antibiotics that help plants resist disease. Fungi assist plants in absorbing water and nutrients together the bacteria and the fungi are known as organic matter. The more organic matter in a soil, the healthier the soil is. Well, this is just an example of some land that's planted with a variety of cover crops. Uh, like I said, up to 30. Um, it will grow when uh, the cash crops aren't on the field and it may grow when the cash crops are on the field. As you see here, they've planted corn right through the cover crops to make sure that the land is always covered, no bare soil. And all of these plants are adding nutrients to the soil and carbon to the soil, which help bring healthier plants. Um, because healthy soil can hold so much water, droughts are better tolerated. Whoops. We have much cleaner air and water when we use uh, regenerative farming. We keep the ground covered at all times so the dirt isn't blowing into the air and it's not blowing into the water. Uh, healthy soil can absorb 20 times its weight in water. So you don't see, like you do around here, if you're out in the country after a storm, you'll see water just running through the fields, running off. And uh, that doesn't happen with regenerative agriculture. The water goes down into the soil, which needs it to help bring us our healthy plants. Um, I don't know, I think you probably all remember early in the spring when the farmers started planting around here and there were a bunch of crashes on I-55 because the soil was blowing so hard across the interstate that drivers couldn't see. So regenerative agriculture doesn't allow for that kind of dirt in the air. Um, we have healthy livestock who actually, instead of emitting methane, help keep carbon in the soil uh, by their poop and their urine and their trampling of those things down into the soil. So they are actually good for the land. Um, they eat grasses, which they digest well, instead of being fed with corn and starchy substances that cause them to be sick. So... If you think about it, in nature, there's always animals out in the fields and out in the country and the forest. You never see land without animals. It's just a natural way um, to keep the land and to keep the animals. So they trample down the plants and they, um, like I said, they eat and do well. We have more wildlife when we use regenerative agriculture. Wildlife eat the um, cover crops especially, and hopefully leave the cash crops alone, although I don't know about that. Um, so you can have lots of deer uh, grazing through this cover crops. And then you also have small animals like rabbits and mice and voles. And then of course you have insects also. 
So their presence brings um, uh, predators to the area, like coyotes, foxes, and bobcats, to make a more stable ecosystem. If you're out in the country at all, you know that we are overrun with deer. There are thousands of deer um, in any given couple of miles that um, eat our crops and run into our cars. And they are becoming ill and diseased because there's so many of them. Um, my husband told me that when he was a child and living on the farm that he owns now, he was in the truck with his grandfather going down the road and his grandfather slammed on the brakes and jumped out of the truck and yelled, look, a deer. It was so unusual to see one, but now the system is completely um, overrun with them. So again, I was gonna show a video about regenerative agriculture and how um, all these plants absorb carbon from the air. And it's really just a matter of photosynthesis. The carbon dioxide and the water go into the leaves and down into the soil. And the carbon feeds all of the little uh, creatures that are in the soil and keeps them healthy and turns uh, certain of them into sugar. And the carbon turns into sugar, which feeds the plants and makes the plants healthy. So it is wonderful for our atmosphere. It's a wonderful way to get rid of carbon dioxide in the um, atmosphere, and it's a great way to have healthy plants. Um, most CO2 is caused by burning fossil fuels, by agriculture, and by deforestation. Um, if we stopped burning fossil fuels today, we would still have all the carbon dioxide, all the greenhouses in the atmosphere, and we we would still have all the problems we have today. If we change the way we do agriculture, we can get those greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and slow down climate change. Some people say we can stop climate change, but I think that's probably optimistic. Um, it improves the profit of the farmer because they don't have to buy chemicals, fertilizer, they don't have to buy as much diesel fuel. Uh, they don't have to buy a whole lot of antibiotics and use them on the animals. Uh, they don't have to till the soil three or four times a year to get it down to where they want to plant. Um, plus, they have a diversified revenue stream because they are selling six or seven or eight different kinds of cash crops rather than corn or beans. So if the market is really high for one and really low for another one year, they're okay. And of course, the benefits for people, we have healthy farm workers. This is my husband, Dave Jackson, and our son, Ryan Jackson. And I couldn't find a picture of them in their bib overalls outside next to a tractor that looked good for them. So I'm just showing you here at a Cardinal game. But we want healthy farm workers. Uh, whether they're picking crops in California and Arizona and Florida, or whether they're the conventional farmers around us. So the, the benefits of regenerative agriculture are clean air, clean water, nutritious food, no chemicals, and the slowing of climate change. So there's our clean food that So you wonder, what is the government doing to encourage this new kind of farming? Um, President Biden put forward an act that got passed through Congress and signed called the Inflation Reduction Act in 2022. And part of that was to um, work toward conservation in agriculture. It was to reduce carbon output by 40% by 2030 and it provided $20 billion over five years to farmers to change their farming practices to prioritize conservation. So that sounds really good, but on May 24th of this year, the Agriculture Committee in Congress defunded this money going to uh, conservation for agriculture and took that money and uh, gave it to conventional farmers through money for fertilizer, crop insurance, and uh, a base price for their crops. 
Uh, also, it cut the SNAP program considerably. Uh, one of our local representatives voted to uh, defund this money for regenerative agriculture. I'm not going to say, but if you want to know later, I'll tell you. You're probably wrong if you're thinking what I think you're thinking. So you might think, what is the difference between organic uh, agriculture and regenerative agriculture? They both want to have food with no chemicals, which is great. Uh, regenerative agriculture, and I'm going to say this is a cabbage plant. I don't know what it is, but that's what I'm going to say. Uh, it only means food that's free from chemicals. So there's nothing in the definition about improving the soil. And the food has, uh, in order to be labeled organic, it has to be certified as such through the United States Department of Agriculture. And there's a lot of paperwork and hoops to go through. And you can see this is all grown in bare dirt. And if you could really see it, you can see tractor tires going down through the field. These are what I'm calling cabbage plants that are grown in regenerative agriculture. You can see that they were sown right through the cover crops. So we've got good, healthy soil growing them, and the plants will have lots of good nutrition in them. Um, there isn't any legal definition of regenerative agriculture. In fact, if you ask 20 farmers, you probably have 10 different definitions. So. There's um, a couple, there's a lot of information out on the internet, and there's a lot of books about regenerative agriculture. These are two that I just bought. I've started to read Dirt to Soil. It's Gabe Brown and his family and their journey from conventional agriculture to regenerative agriculture. And then the documentary that I saw, I didn't know that there was a book that accompanied it, so I just bought that. I'm curious to see what it's like. There are several regenerative farms in our area that sell their uh, produce, mostly their meat and eggs, uh, directly to consumers. There's a website down here, and I think it's in the order of service, about how to get this map. And then you can close in on the central Illinois area and see uh, information about what farms are out there. So to close, let the beauty we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. Rumi. Thank you. Now, would you stand as you're willing or able and help uh, sing our closing hymn, The Blue Boat Home?
Joyce? Jean Jost. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it will do our chalice extinguishing. Good morning. Our chalice extinguishing today is optimistic. So that's helpful. It's entitled Hope Continues by Kevin Jago. When the candle dims, the wax almost spent, the light turns amber like a sunset. Still, it provides light. Still, it provides heat. Still, it can candle new, kindle new flame and pass its glow on and continue to new illumination. When sunsets turn to new days, when seasons transform all, when the candle dims, all is not lost. Hope continues, uncertain and true, like candlelight ready to spark again. May you be changed. May you leave this time together changed. May the promises you have made to yourself about who you want to be feel closer to the reality of who you are right now. May you share that feeling of transformation wherever you go. May it spread into every word, deed, thought, and interaction until we are all changed, transformed, and transforming together becoming our better selves. So be it. Yeah, I have to find out what you're doing.